Today's message is called Anchors Away. Anchors Away. And does anybody remember what the series we're talking about? Or the series that we were in for this month? Or if we even talked about it? Yes. Sorry, I can't see you. Yeah! Good job, Destiny. Hope. We are in our series of hope. And one of the things I love about hope, and the Bible talks about hope, is that it calls it an anchor for the soul. An anchor for your soul. Now, why does an anchor need to weigh so much? Well, the boat, also known as the Sea Wise, was a boat that was 365 thousand tons. It was a giant, like, ginormous boat. And you think about it, so you're out in the middle of the ocean, and this boat's going up and down, and the cool thing about the way that the anchor system works is that anchors keep you in a fixed, well, not a fixed position, but they keep you from just wandering out in sea. They keep you from going further out, miles upon miles, or from crashing into the land, it keeps you locked in a fixed position. And the interesting thing about anchors is that when when an anchor is cast into the sea, see, an anchor, when it's thrown out, it can't just get cast anywhere. The captain actually has to look at his charts and see what is the best place to put the anchor. Because he can't just put the anchor anywhere. If you were to put it on rocks, which is one of the worst places that you can put it in, because it could get stuck and you could possibly never move again. If he puts it in somewhere where it's too soft, the anchor will pull up and the boat will continue to drift to sea. Now, the chain is long, is purposely long. Oh, I did spit. Sorry, my bad. (laughs) My bad. So the chain is purposefully long because of the tension that happens when the boat is pulled. So the uh, the boat throws the anchor down. It's cast in the perfect spot. The captain says, yep, we're going to drop the anchor right here. It's the perfect perfect material on the bottom of the ocean. It's going to keep us in a locked position. And when they cast the anchor, there's this slack that happens in it. And what happens is that when the water rises and when it lowers, is it rises and what happens is that tension begins to build up in that chain that's in the anchor that's connected to the boat. And all that is just potential energy that's just stored in that chain. And what happens is that after the water rises and it settles, all that energy in the chain pulls the boat back where it needs to be. Because it's, it's locked in and it's not going anywhere. Anchors away. One of the most important things you need to realize is that when we give our lives to Christ, we need to understand at the beginning, in order for us to finish the race with confidence, we must be anchored to the hope in which we first believed it. Hope is one of the fundamentals of your faith, of what you believe. Because what are you hoping for? Pop quiz, what are you hoping for? You got saved, what are you hoping for now? Peace, okay. Think long term. Think long term. You get saved, what are you hoping for? RJ, you're about to, you're like, hey. Heaven, yeah, that's it, Heaven. Because a Christian walk is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so many times you can get carried away thinking, like, okay, I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to get to heaven, and then, you know, five hours goes by, it's like, man, this is taking a really long time. <laughs> and we get super discouraged. So one of, the, one of the things we need to understand is that hope is an anchor for your soul. Let's go to Hebrews 6, um, 18, 19. They should all be in order. So if you're taking notes, Hebrews 6, Verses 18 through 19. So that by the two unchangeable, I know I said 18, 19. Can we do 17, 18, 19? 
when you get a chance, I'll just, I'll just keep on reading this. But here's what it says. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Oh, there we go. So here we go. This is actually the beginning. So uh, Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. Okay, hold on. Let's break this down for a second. Go back. So desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise. Who are heirs of the promise? We are. It's talking about, and we go back, so we talk about in Hebrews, which they believe it was possibly Paul, but there's a lot of speculation. Anyway, so the, the one who wrote, the author of this book is also is talking about in the very beginning when, when God made a promise to Abraham and God made a promise to Isaac and then God made a promise and then God made a promise that one day his son would come to earth. And see, it, was, it kept on going and going and going with this promise. And so what we have here, a God desiring, you need to know something, God desires a lot of things for you. But sometimes we lack the patience to receive it. We lack the patience to receive it because we want it now. And I have to admit, I'm a now, we're a now generation. We can, everything's instant. If it takes three seconds, it's too long. If that video you showed me takes more than 10 seconds, I'm not interested. It's just not, not, yeah. So, in the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, us, the unchangeableness of his purpose. In, I can't read that. It's way too far away. Interposed with an oath. Next. Next slide. So that by two unchangeable things. Okay, you need to know something about God. When God says something, he can't change it. Because it's spoken into existence. Another thing that God cannot change is his word. So not only when he speaks, says something, okay, hey, it's going to be like this. Also, in his word was written down his promise. He's like, I'm going to make an oath. So here's the two unchangeable things, his word. So who he is, one, and then his word. In which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. Next. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. You know why he's talking about anchors? Do you know the type of people that Jesus was, who, the, the type of people that were his disciples? They were fishermen. They understood boats and anchors very well. So when he's talking about anchors and being locked in a place where it's an anchor for your soul, when things get hard, stressful, tiring, and you wanna give up, they're like, oh, this makes sense. It, yeah. A hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Now, hope comes from the Greek word. I love Greek words. Hope comes from, it sounds really weird because it sounds like a Spanish word trying, like a, anyway. It sounds, the Greek word is elpise. 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 What does that mean? It is the expectation of the hope that is to come, which is uh, being with him forever, heaven. Locked in, like that's the end. The end goal of our hope is eternity with Him, and this is the hope that it's talking about. So we go on to Hebrews six eleven. But since we are out, since, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now we we'll go back to Hebrews uh, six eleven. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope till the end. We'll go to the next one, Hebrews 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's go to the next one, Ephesians 4.4. 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you are called in one hope of your calling. And then Ephesians 2, 12. Remember that you were at the time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
And then First Thessalonians 4.13 was about the helmet, having a helmet as the hope. Hope of the helmet. Salvation. So one of the things, so as, as I was reading those, there was this, there's, there's some things that we can do that we can walk out and practically in our daily lives to help us hold on and be anchored into this hope. And I came up with this really weird acronym called CHARB. CHARB. Like charbroiled. It's, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, what was up with that, but CHARB. The first one is C. Confess it. Hebrews, and you can write this next to the, to the, to the Bible verse, but it's Ephesians, Hebrews ten twenty three. Confess it. You have to hear it. You have to see it to believe it. Did I write that? I did not write that. I did not write, you have to see it to believe it. So, um, <laughs> I don't know who put that up there, but I know that was not me. Confess it. Well, here, I guess you could, what you could do, you have to confess it, you have to see it here. You have to see it in your mind before you believe it. Mm, no, I don't like that, nope. Definitely not in parentheses. Nope, I did not put that up there. So you have to confess it. What, what do you have to do? You have to confess your hope. Sometimes you have to remind yourself on a daily basis, why do I believe what I believe? Why am I, why am I doing this Christian thing? Why am I following God? Why am I fill in the blank? Because here's what's going to happen is you're going to get tested. You're going to get tried. You're going you're to be questioned about what you believe and why you believe. So you need to throw, you need to cast that anchor. Anchors away. Throw that anchor down. When people start, when the waters start to rise and that water starts to try and take you, cast, throw that anchor down. Anchors away. This is why I believe what I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, you really believe that, that, you know, that God didn't come down and just have, have sex with Mary and that's how they had a baby? Like, no. It was immaculate conception. God spoke the word to it into existence. Why can't he speak a baby into existence? Come on. Come on. You got you to gotta know your word. You got to know who you are. And you got to confess it sometimes on a daily basis so that you can remember and be reminded of what you believe. Confess. Hold fast to the confession. H stands for helmet. It protects your... There we go. And that works. I like that. Did I write that? Okay, protects your mind. Sounds good. What? No, the, the first one I didn't, <laughs> the first one I did not put in there. See it, believe it. <sighs> Confess is you have to hear it. You have to hear it. Ah, that is in my, yeah, that's, that, that's not in my notes. Okay, anyway. Um, helmet, it protects your mind. What does it go back to? Look it. Oh, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. My bad, bro. <laughs> helmet. Helmet. 1 Thessalonians 5.8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That just goes along with confessing it. When you confess, it's like throwing a helmet on your head. It protects you from all the garbage that's being flung out there. Everything you see on social media, everything your friends are talking about, everything that your mom and dad might be trying to tell you, whether they believe or not, that doesn't line up with the word of God, or your teachers. Come on, I love teachers. We love teachers. We love teachers. And you got to check, check their teachings with the word. You got to check their teachings with the word. Because if they're saying something that doesn't line up with the word... No, you what? No smacking teachers. You hear? You hear this? Is he in your class? He's not on your mind. Okay. Well, you can let them know that he said that, so they can beat him up. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so you confess. As you confess, you protect. And the next thing is a. It anchors you, keeps you in times of uncertainty. Come on. How many of you are living in a state right now where life is just very uncertain? I can tell you right now, I am. Like, you don't know what tomorrow holds. 
You don't know what relationships are coming your way. You don't know if the family is still going to be together in the next week. You don't know if your friends at school are going to be hanging around you much longer. You don't know. So look at, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. And I tell you right now, sometimes you're that boat. And people are riding with you along this journey. And sometimes your anchor isn't only keeping you down, it's keeping the people around you down. And when the waters rise and when they lower, they're going to see how you act, how you're anchored, what you believe, why you believe. Because honestly, it's that is a, it's that is, that's probably even a, a greater testimony than what you're saying right now, or what you could be possibly saying to them, is how you react and respond to the circumstances that are happening around you. Ah, you're, you're, you're a goody, you're a goody two-shoes, you're a Christian boy, you're a Christian girl, man, you probably never, and you're like, yep, I never have, and I don't want to, because I know where that goes, I know where that leads. Ah, you're just a, and they just write you off, ah, you're just a, Ah, they're no fun. Ah, they're a hypocrite. Ah, they're, come on. Just because someone speaks it doesn't mean it's true. Just because someone speaks it doesn't mean it's true. Ah, this guy doesn't believe that there's 3,600 whatever genders out there. Ah, this guy doesn't think that girls can... Marry girls and guys can marry guys. Ah, oh, you're so old. You're so Old Testament. You're so old Christian. That's what the word says. Listen, when someone comes at you and says, "Ah, oh, man, what do you believe? Do you believe that?" It's like this is what the word says. And how do we know that? Because that's what Jesus did. When the devil came to tempt him, he didn't say, the "Devil said, what do you think?" And Jesus responded. The word says, the word says, the word says, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I I also, you know, it says in that Bible, too, that, uh, you know, if you jump off, what do you think? It doesn't matter what I think. The word says, don't put God to the test. Come on, man. Okay, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms. Because, look, back in the day, Adam and Eve, they gave me that authority. They just handed it over to me. And, uh, and if you want it, I'll just give you the authority over all the earth. Uh, I was like, and he's like, what do you think? I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. The word says. The word says, man, God's the one true God. You're not. He has all the authority. So you can peace out. See, when we feel like we have to defend, we can defend from the word. Because the word is the greatest defense. (laughs) And when you try and bring it on to yourself, like, well, I think that. Listen, people are waiting to lure you in a trap to say, well, what do you think? Oh, well, your thinking is wrong. You don't believe that? That's old thinking. That's old thinking. See, look at the Bible's thinking. The Bible's truth never changes. And so when you're faced with confrontation and you're faced with challenges and you're faced with questions, what do you think the Bible says that? No, 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 I want to eat. Well, read the Bible. That's what I think. Because when you bring it back to the Word, they don't got nothing on you. Because the Word's the final word. The Word anchors you. The next one is, I think it's remember or reflect. Oh, remember. Don't forget. Don't forget it. Don't forget why you wake up every morning. See, look at it, the problem. Our struggle isn't waking up. Our struggle is not waking up and experiencing God and like, oh, I had this amazing encounter. See, where the real work happens is when everyday life happens. 
oh man, I didn't, I didn't get the amazing revelation from God. The angels didn't, oh, you know. And and here's what we can get. A, here's what we can get caught up in. We can get caught up in the feelings and the moment and how amazing it was. And let me tell you, those moments happen absolutely. But we can't live for the moments of the mountaintops. And I think that's the only way that God speaks to us. God speaks to us every day in the mundane. When you get up and you read your word, like, oh, the Bible says that God loves me. Oh, man, that's not anything new. Hold on. The Bible says that God's loved the world. Oh, yeah, I've read that a thousand times. <laughs> Listen. If you're, getting to that, if you're getting to a point where it's just like, oh, yeah, I've read that before, you need to keep on reading it again. <laughs> you need to ask God for a, for a revelation of what you just read. Because you can read the same thing over and over and over and over again. And the word is like a diamond. Every time you look at it a different way, it sparkles. It's like, woo, shine bright like a diamond. <laughs> right like a diamond. No. It, it, you, you get to see different angles of what the word means. And that's the cool thing about the word is that it's always, it's al- there's always a new way that the Holy Spirit can reveal something to you through the word. You have to remember. Don't forget it. The next thing is reflect. I hope this one's right. First Thessalonians 4.13, don't neglect. Maybe I was just writing. Maybe I was just making stuff up. Hmm. Hmm. Reflect. Remember what it was like without it. And I think that's the part where we get caught up in everyday life where we don't remember, like, what was it like when you didn't have Jesus? Because life gets, let's get on, life gets good sometimes. Life gets good. You get great. It's great. You go out on Friday nights. You're hanging out with your friends, and everything's good, and it's easy to forget what it was like to not have hope, what it was like to not have a group of people that you could really talk with, get along with, be encouraged with. You got you to gotta reflect. Man, I remember what it was like without Jesus. That was some dark times. And then I remember what I did when I needed to anchor myself in who Jesus was. The last one is B, believe together. Encourage and be encouraged by others. This is the most crucial part. I want you to look at everyone around you where you're sitting at. Really quick. Look at everyone around you. Those are your brothers and sisters. And when you need help, When you need help, listen, when you need help and when you need encouragement and when you need someone just to really pray with you and just do life with you, reach out to one of your friends. Look, please pray with me. I am hurting. I need help. I am sinking. I don't know what to do. My grade, I'm failing in my grades. My parents' marriage is falling apart. I'm losing all my friends. I'm sucking at track. I, I'm not popular or I don't have very many friends. And the friends I do have, I'm losing. Like, I need help. I can't make any friends. I can't do anything. I can't seem to get that boyfriend or girlfriend, which you shouldn't until after high school. Well, that's just personal opinion. It's not the word. But here's the thing. We are here for each other. And you've got to remember that. You've got to remember that is that when you're going back to school and when you're going back to everyday life, you can reach out to your friends. You can reach out to us. I encourage you before the end of service today, if you don't have someone's number here from youth group, you need to get it. And if you don't have any of the youth leaders' numbers, you need to get it so that you can message them and you can ask them, hey, I am struggling. Can you pray with me? Can you believe with me for restoration, for good grades? Look at God doesn't think that that's like anything less. Good grades, I don't have time for that. I'm managing the world. (laughs) No, he's got time for you, trust me. He's got time for your problems. He's got time for your pain. He's got time for your hurting. He's got time for you name it. And he's just waiting. He's waiting for you to turn to him and cast your anchor, cast your hope in him. 
Not only is it an expectation of the end to come, but I see sometimes we forget that, listen, this life is just so temporal and our hope is in eternity. Because at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, and when I'm old and gray and six feet under, no one's going to remember me. Yeah, maybe for a short time, but I don't, I don't know who my great, 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 great uncle, grandma, grandpa, who are. I don't know who they are. Because this world is so temporal. This world does not last. But I tell you what does last, eternity with him. And when everything's said and done, and all the tears are wiped away, all the pain and suffering is gone, this world is wiped clean, it's going to be eternity with him. It's going to be a celebration. It's going to be a party. It's going to be feasting. It's going to be enjoying what we were created for. We were created for relationship with him. And you go back to the very beginning. What, 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 what were we created for? Why did he create Adam and Eve? For relationship. And what happened? It was severed. And now our hope is that we're going to have face-to-face relationship with him again. At the end, when this life is done. And so when you think about eternity and then you look at the problems that you're facing now, it's nothing compared to what we're going to get. When he looks at us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome. Come on. Join me in eternity. You did good. Death is very real. So is hope.